Are you struggling to lose weight and keep it off? Tired of wasting time and money on starvation diets that lead to more frustration and stress? If there was a weight loss solution that could actually work for you, would you try it? Then head to Golo.com. I'm Steve. I lost 138 pounds in nine months on Golo. I'm Amber. I've lost 128 pounds with Golo. If you're ready to take back control of your life, head to Golo.com now and see how Golo can work for you. That's Golo.com. My sleep is way better. My inflammation has gone way down. Golo saved my life. I was way overweight. That's what sent me down the path. I wanted to make sure and live for my kid. I have literally tried everything. I was on the verge of getting gastric bypass surgery and I saw the Golo commercial and it was the last thing I tried because it worked. Join over 2 million people who found a better way to lose weight with Golo. Your healthier and happier life begins at Golo.com. That's G-O-L-O.com. Again, G-O-L-O.com. Hey, welcome to Kim Commando Explains. Each day, determination drives people like you to do better. Sometimes it goes well. Maybe that extra workout at the gym helps you run faster for that marathon. You made yourself study a difficult topic and it paid off. Now you have an understanding of the world. But sometimes determination leads folks down dark paths. Say a man feels slighted after a woman rejected him. He writes her hateful letters for 10, 15 years, sabotages her jobs, spoofs her accounts. He sends messages, pretending to be her, saying she hates her friends and her family. He's determined to destroy her life, all because she wouldn't date him in college. This is a true story, a story about a cyber stalker. Online harassment hurts roughly four in 10 Americans. That's according to the Pew Research Center. Almost half of American adults have been harassed online. A quarter of people say the harassment was severe. But online harassment can be tough to understand if you've never gone through it. A lot of people shrug and go, huh, well, so what? Just put the phone down, get off the internet. Yeah, well, the victim can get off the internet, but the bad guy or gal won't. He might go to her boss, her friends, her family, even federal government agencies, trying to smear her reputation and frame her, maybe in imaginary crimes. Yeah, this is also a true story. So let's be clear, online harassment is a serious issue. It's a long-term campaign designed to break you down over days, months, years. It's born of hatred and the worst type of determination. And modern-day tech makes it more common than ever before. In this episode, I'm looking into the defense strategies you should take if you're ever the target of a hateful stranger's evil eye. Consider this an essential cybersecurity lesson. As we become more and more polarized as a society, a lot of people feel emboldened to destroy anyone they see as an enemy. You can do something as innocuous as liking a tweet or smiling at the wrong person. Anything, that's right, anything can earn a cyber stalker's eternal hatred. And it's no surprise, there's evidence that this issue is getting a lot worse as the years pass. That's why you should learn how to fight this threat ahead of time. It's especially true for women. We're twice as likely as men to experience sexual harassment online. Lucky us. But here's a ray of light. There are savvy tech pros who dedicate themselves to saving people from online harassment. One of them is the good friend of our show, Rico Danielson. He graduated from fighting the Taliban online to fighting domestic digital tormentors. Try to say that three times fast. Uh, We're going to hear from him today and get his expert tips on staying safe. So stay right where you are. Coming up, you don't want to miss Cyberstalking 101. So, Rico, tell me, what has been the most bizarre case you've ever heard or experienced or worked on regarding cyber stalking? Okay, so I've had multiple, multiple of these uh, accounts and also uh, a variety of cyber stalkers, how they do stuff. But the most recent, not the recent one, like within the last year or so, was one where this person actually took out multiple phone lines, went to Walmart paid with a vanilla prepaid card and just kind of went through the whole motions of actually immersing themselves as a cyber stalker, created four or five uh, different profiles per element per phone. So about 15 different profiles and a cyber stalk the person that way. 15 different profiles. Wow. Yeah. So whenever we showed up on the spot to do the forensics on the phone, uh, because it escalated to a violent, violent uh, premise, we um we showed up and there was five phones and each phone had about five different um 
five different accounts, like different social media accounts. And it just blew my mind. Did the person who was getting stalked actually know who was doing all this stuff? So there was all these signature traits that were saying, hey, this person might be local, might be someone you know, might be someone within your circle, just because of the subtle hints uh, and the subtleties of things they only knew personally, uh, such as, you know, what's for dinner, what time you go to the gym, you know, who's that person next to you, stuff like that. These are things that are only a person within a two degree proximity would actually know of you. So the person who's getting stalked is getting hit from all these different directions, not being able to figure it all out. It must have been driving that person bonkers. Yeah, the, the source of obfuscation, if you will, um, they wanted to go and obfuscate their IP addresses, uh, their domain names, their Facebooks, coming in from different VPNs. It was very sophisticated attack, cyber stalking, if you will. But um, where where it led off was, again, the, the commonalities of the language, the commonalities of locally known um, items of interest. And yes, it threw the person off. However, after a couple of months or so uh, of, dip, of deep diving, uh, we were able to figure out who it was and where it came from and, and kind of show that this was a person of interest. So how would, how do you actually define cyber stalking? What do you think that definition would be? Sure. I personally defined it uh, somebody who is stalking you or monitoring you with a known malicious intent. I think Arizona has the um, the cyber stalking laws as an un- uninvited intention of of uh, of attention and also uninvited um, <clears throat> malicious intention, if you will. And if once we start grabbing those different different definitions, that's when we can kind of say, "Hey, I'm being cyber stalked." Uh, there's one thing of monitoring persons because you know a parent can monitor a child, and that's kind of what we have to do as parents. The other uh, aspect of it is. You know, we have people who are monitoring people for malicious purposes. And once you establish those malicious purposes based on values and beliefs and also their intention, that's when you can have, define what is a cyber stalker specifically for you. So obviously there's different degrees of cyber stalking, you know, like this, like the one that you mentioned that just goes to the extreme. And then there were just other cases where somebody says, well, you know, maybe it's just a coincidence. What are some psychological traits of somebody who is a cyber stalker? And can we find, can we figure that out? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a, (laughs) there's this free tool. It's called Google analytics. Right. Um, And you can actually punch in, you know, like Rico Danielson and you can kind of get a demographical mapping or a, a data analysis dump of where the most common person is, is searching, you know, Rico Danielson. And then from there you can, you can actually start leading and understanding the, the metadata, metadata analysis of how you know Facebook or Instagram or different IP addresses, how they kind of congregate together. As technology aggressively moves forward, it actually just is very much like people. They actually congregate together, and you can find a commonality um, main switching from there, if you will. So I understand how Google Analytics works, and, and it is interesting yeah. because if you figure out with Google Analytics with Kim Commando, this is actually kind of funny is that we're looking at SEO for the website. Like, you know, what brings people to commando.com? So about the, (laughs) you'll laugh, about the sixth or seventh question that somebody will type into Google about me is, um, the question is, is Kim Commando male or female? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That would be female. And you can attest to that, right, Rico? Absolutely. Just, yeah. okay. <laughs> Very much, yeah. <laughs> so Google Analytics is an amazing tool. But when we look at the profile of somebody who is a cyber stalker, mm-hmm. what is it that they're trying to achieve? So from my understanding and my experience, cyber stalkers are trying to achieve a point of connection uh, and also recognition. Hey, look at me. Hey, this is me. And they'll go through high extremes uh, in, in regards to, I've seen people go all the way back to two year, two year old posts and comment on there and then go back way even further, uh, and find up, find, uh, something you published possibly and go back there and post it just to get your attention to get the, the attention of, Hey, this is me. And then they'll start doing certain things, um, such as, um, they know key phrases or key attributes to provoke you and say, Hey, this is me. Now I want your attention. And this is why I want your attention. 
And it's very fascinating what kind of drives these people. Uh, usually it's a, more likely it's a psychological trait that they have not been either loved or something of that matter. They don't get attention or something or obsession. That's another interesting one it's within itself. Let's talk about obsession because mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are jilted. They get online and they have to keep looking to see what that person is doing and they can't sure. seem to give it up. They can't seem to break it. See, be, before the Internet, if you met somebody, you didn't like them, well, you know, you just wouldn't answer your phone, right? But now that yeah. you can't really get away from it and the temptation is there just to say, I'm just going to take a peek to see what they look like or what they're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. The sensation for obsession and now that you, you compound that effect of data on demand and I can sit there in the evening, late at night, and I'm looking at my screen saying, I wonder what this person's doing. Oh, and then this cookie trail leads me to another article or something else. I saw the picture that got tagged over here at this gym. What are they doing at that gym? Why are they there? And so this, this inundation of data actually feeds the, the mind of wanting to know more. And it just propagates itself over and over. Usually, like you just said, it takes you maybe a couple months, a year back in the day, just to get rid of somebody or whatever. Now it's now they have full access to your life. They want to know where you are, how you're doing, what you're doing, who you're doing it with. And it just becomes not only a privacy issue of concern, but also a, a medical issue, if you will, uh, for the individual doing it. Do the police offer any help? I mean, if you go to the police and say, I think I'm being stalked, generally, do they come forward and say, yes, here, let us help you? You got to paint the picture pretty good for police engagement, especially for stalking. Um, if there's a source of damage, if there's a source of threatening, you can you can paint that picture. Uh, but the police will only go so far. The more rural you get into the towns, chances are they don't have the bandwidth or the resources. Uh, with the bigger cities, they're inundated with whatever they're dealing with nowadays, whether it's riots, whether it's protests or whatever. And it's going to get very, very hard for for police officer law enforcement to engage into the type of, um, you know, threat acting that needs to be handled because they don't have the resources. Yeah. And, you know, it becomes really difficult too, because I'm of the mm -hmm. belief that smartphones and the internet and all these devices that sometimes if somebody is not mentally straight, that it really can feed that mental illness because they start oh, yeah. putting connections together where the connections weren't there, but suddenly to them, their reality becomes their reality when it's nobody else's reality. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big, uh, I think a sociopathic trait is, you know, my truth is my truth. And it's like, that's cool, but <laughs> in reality, this is a reality over here. And when, whenever you get somebody who, who's severely mentally ill and you put them on social media, there are studies now that have exacerbated their mental illness. Now, you talked about in the beginning about this person creating all these different profiles and then basically just attacking the victim. What about <laughs> installing spyware on somebody's phone? How easy is that? I mean, is it still as easy like as sending them a link to an electronic greeting card and they click it and then they get spyware put on their phone? So uh, it depends on the phone. Yes, there's still that type of spyware out there. Now it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, now, the reason one I've actually just dealt with for a medical provider was um, they'll send them a text message. Hey, this is your salary or hey, whatever crafty email or message you want to send. Do you mind going to this website? Go ahead and click on this, this URL. It redirects you to a specific area. Oh, shoot. Hey, can you go ahead and enter your email? I just need to make sure it's you and your email. And it gives you this error message. And what happens is that error message actually captured all your credentials and at that point, they can start doing their attack. So there's just a little bit more steps ahead of the game versus back in the day, you could just drop some sort of malicious um, malicious code or malicious spyware, if you will. And then once it's installed, is it the traditional signs like, you know, the phone is hot, even though you haven't been using it, the battery yeah. gets drained and you're like, wow, I mean, the iPhone battery is bad, but this one's horrible. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> uh, and then you start seeing apps and maybe your data usage goes up. Are those some still some clear cut signs or are there others that we should be looking out for? Now it's the game changes. The game has completely changed now. Now um, let's just talk about like tablet devices, right? Let's talk about computers. Cell phones are getting there. Um, there are specific things called PowerShell commands that do headless PowerShell commands, which 
means it never drops an agent on your phone. It just auto, auto man, automatically commu uh, communicates on your phone and conducts the command on the phone. And it starts grabbing the information. And then it starts calling out to a beacon to call a C2, a command two. And it starts getting the information saying, okay, this is Rico's phone. This is his password. Let's just go ahead and start doing the attack now. Let's just get to it. And then all this stuff is automated. So it's going fast, it's quick. So before you know it, your credentials are stolen, your bank information is gone, and chances are you're probably going to get ransomware all within about 45 minutes. Wow. And you mentioned ransomware, but is it the same thing as if somebody's putting a recorder on my device, on my computer, laptop, or whatever, so that they can see exactly everything that I'm doing? So depending on the, on the complexity of the ransomware, whether you're dealing with uh, some sort of crypto locker, whether you're dealing with Jigsaw, or something different, right? Or Petra. Um, it really depends on how the ransomware is going to be used. But the main goal of ransomware in this in this current um, situation is to go in there, obtain access to your control, live off the land, stay in the environment as long as I can, gain all my all your information, predominantly healthcare, um, financial, legal, and also something I can exploit like derogatory pictures. And then from there, I will go ahead and execute my my cyber extortion. Uh, I'll probably, before that, I'll go ahead and delete everything, exit stage right and say, hey, Rigo, I'm ransomware actor so-and-so, and here's my proof of life. I'm confused on how we got to ransomware from cyber stalking. Oh, that's not too hard. So cyber stalking is part of a reconnaissance. So cyber stalking can actually get to the point of uh, what they're doing is a, is a reconnaissance phase, right? They're understanding who you are. They're understanding how they can um, further understand your information, your demographical information, your, your who you date. And then what they can they say is, hey, you know, if you don't pay me a ransom, I'm going to go to your boyfriend, girlfriend, oh, husband, I see. lover. Okay. I see. Yeah, and yeah, then they're so, going to release all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming up, we're going to be talking about cloning phones. How hard is it? Could you do it? What's available on the dark web? But first, we have to say a few thank yous to our partners in this program. Hey, welcome back to Kim Commando Explains. We're talking to our good friend of the show, Rico Danielson, about cyber stalking. And a lot of people are always freaked out, Rico, about maybe somebody could clone my phone and then they get copies of everything that I'm doing on my phone and they see where I'm going. How difficult is that to do? So cloning the phone is not difficult. It depends on the type of threat actor you're being engaged by and how sophisticated they are. Um, they can do remotely if if there's some sort of engagement upon the person who owns the phone. So it's not too far-fetched to see people getting all their data uh, captured, deleted, or preserved somewhere else. And then at that point, they get ransom in exchange for their data. But what if it's not ransom? Maybe it's just, uh, I want to know everything that my ex is doing. And I want to see copies of everything that they're doing. I don't want them to pay me a ransom. I just want to have all mm -hmm. this intel about them because I'm obsessed with them. So I've seen that where the reconnaissance phase where people do that, where they'll deploy some sort of um, cloning agent, if you will. And there is freeware out there that can do it. It's on GitHub or wherever you want to search at. Um, however, deploying that agent is going to be a little bit more difficult. It just require, again, uh, you know, a user interacting with the, with the URL or the clickability of something. But yeah, there, for sure there is something out there. So you don't need to have physical access to the phone to clone it. Yeah, in lieu of having physical access to the phone, you're going to create. There's a creation of of a portal or something that makes the the user of the phone engage with the with the, the cyber stalker, right? Where it's like, hey, I need you to enter this information, and then boom, they they were able to get the, most of your information out of your phone just by clicking on on a bad malicious link. So I guess to prevent that from happening, you just have to again, have common sense and be careful where you click. Yeah, there's also other things like uh, URL checkers you can deploy on your phone. Um, and then I think Verizon recently uh, gives this little cool feature where it says, hey, you have a thing, this possibly looks malicious. And if you hold it down, it shows you the reality of it, what's behind it. Does antivirus or security software actually help in this type of situation? I mean, can it flag it if you had it on your device? Yeah, so with with uh, anti uh, you know anti ransomware, anti malware, stuff like that, what you're going to have to do is actually make sure that the rules 
and it's continually updated because there's so many dictionaries out there that say, hey, sure. do you know about these bad malicious things going on? And what your antivirus should do is actually ping it back and say, thank you for those updates. I'll be on the lookout for these signature things. If your phone is cloned, how do you know? Um, you'll probably see some indicators of compromise. Not that you're really paying attention, but you might just start seeing some weird stuff of, hey, you might start getting some ads or some be be put in a geolocation like Russia or India. And you're like, why am I, why is my Facebook attracting all these Indian profiles or why is my Facebook or my Instagram going to Russian stuff? Why is that? <laughs> Google thinks I'm in like Detroit and I'm not. Okay. I happen to be in Des Moines. <laughs> That's where our phones, we actually have a defense mechanism of geofencing, which is saying, I don't want anything outside the United States. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go. And so that you can set that up in the settings, I assume? Yeah, you can do that. You can say, um, you know, just keep my cell phone for cell phone, uh, U.S. cell, cell base towers only, um, your network traffic. You don't want it to go any, anywhere outside the United States. Um, those are simple geofencing things. And also you can, you could possibly, if you have an antivirus on your phone, you could set those up as well. So if somebody wants to prevent from being cyber stalked, I mean, we we talked about the common sense things, you know, don't click and be careful and you know, don't give out your phone number, get it. But, but is a, is a burner phone or a Google voice number? I mean, if you think that something's going on, but you still need to be in contact with family and friends, is that an option? Sure. There are burner phones you can possibly do. You can do trace, uh, trace one phones, trace two phones. Um, uh, you know, always getting a different phone number is not a problem, especially, um, if you, if you need to give out your phone number, you're really not comfortable of, of who's going to call you. Just give them your, give them a burner phone, if you will. Google number is pretty good, but just remember that's going to be tied to an address, an email address. So whatever email address you use, just be willing to part ways with it. What are some rules of thumb? I mean, if they really think that this is happening, I mean, they want to keep copies of everything, of course, right? Uh, screenshots, sure. whatever. Um, what advice can you give people? So if you think you're being cyber stalked, one of the, or a few of the things that I would say is, you know, start looking within your inner circles, start capturing those different messages because um, in the social media platform, like let's just take Facebook, for example, and someone's hitting you up on that, chances are three or four messages down, somebody with the, a like message probably hit you up. It's probably in your trash or spam. I'll look in the, those different areas, same with your text messages, start preserving those. If you're getting phone calls, start preserving those. You can, you can work with your cell phone provider as well and say, Hey, look, I'm starting to get cyber stock. Uh, these things are acting kind of weird. Can we go ahead and block these numbers? And they should be able to do that. Is, is it terribly difficult to be a cyber stalker? I mean, is it, do you, do you need to have, I don't think you do. I don't think you need a lot of technical acumen in order to really pull this up. And, and the reason why I say that is that so often I get the calls on the show and it's either that, you know, my ex was computer illiterate, technologically an idiot, or my ex was a network engineer, and now he knows everything that I'm doing. And what I have always told people is that, you know what, if you're breaking up, you need to break up totally. Uh, meaning like if he leaves or she leaves, get a new router, right? <laughs> Change all your passwords, lie on your security questions because they can probably break into your accounts. Um, yep. What are other common mistakes that people make that, that we can help them out with? So you're right. It does not take a lot of technical aptitude to, um, to be a cyber soccer, but I realized that's kind of like the, the dumb to mediocre people who become cyber soccer's. Uh, they just really don't take that fourth effort. The real good cyber soccer's actually take it a step further and completely remove themselves from the persona. They're going to pursue, pursue uh, cyber stalking. And it's very, very fascinating. But um, to answer your question, no, there, you, it does not take a lot. It just takes a lot of ambition to do it. Well, talk more about that, where you say that they totally remove themselves from the situation so that this way it would be harder for them to find. Yeah, a uh, case I was working a long time ago. <laughs> um, I, it was a defamatory case. And I said, okay, well, let's go investigate this person. And we're, I was working with the investigator. I was working with an attorney. And we went to follow them one day and this person would go to Goodwill places. And I said, okay, why are they going to Goodwill places? Why are they going to pawn shops? And they would actually go buy Verizon hotspots and basically put a brand new SIM card in them because Verizon hotspots are uh, universal. 
and they would actually get a new IP address, sit somewhere else, get a burner laptop, create a burner profile, and take it a step further and just cyber stock as they wanted. And whenever they're done, they just throw it all away and wipe their hands clean. How do you find somebody like that? It took a while. It took about uh, six months, but it was a matter of understanding who the person, the person of interest is always going to be a person of interest. At the end of the day, there's always going to be someone that you think it is. And we just start there. We start analyzing the person. We start analyzing their behavioristics. What are they doing? How are they doing it? What's their demographic information? What's their topology in regards to social media? And kind of see their interests. You study them as much as they're studying the person. Do they follow certain habits, meaning like they'll post always at 10 a.m. or 11 p.m.? So they have certain habits for their persona. The more sophisticated cyber stalkers, they'll say, okay, if I'm eating at 5 p.m. dinner, whatever, I'm not going to start posting. My persona is not going to start posting until 7 p.m. So therefore, they don't know that I'm eating an early dinner. And they kind of actually have this like dual personality type deal, if you will. That's fascinating. So mm -hmm. in order to torment somebody or whatever their goal is, is that they actually have to create somebody else because they don't want to be found. Wait, there's mm -hmm. some real mental issues going on. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it's very, very fascinating. And, and furthermore, like the, the cyber professionals who do this for a living, that it just blows my mind how, they, how well they do it and how fast they do it. So about the dark web, people are always concerned like, oh, you know, they can go on the dark web and they can buy anything. True? Uh, In this case for cyber stalking? You can't buy anything. It, you, it, to get to the dark web is a process. Um, it, it's, if it's a single answer, yes, but it is beyond more sophisticated than that. What are the different levels of cyber stalking? Let's go, let's go A and B. Let's just keep that very simple. Um, you have a stalker who just wants to be seen, wants to be heard or, or is jealous or is, is obsessed with you and they just want to cause damage. And it's not too far away that they're using their cell phone. They're using their own computer to do these things. So it won't be that hard to find them. You just, you just got to give it some time. Then you have B, the more complex one where they're going to sit on sit on you for about six months, maybe a year to understand what you're doing, where you're going, how you're doing it, what platform to use, maybe even create a pseudo platform of you so they can attract different friends of you, so they can engage that, hey, you got a second profile, Rico, uh, check it out, hey, how you been, blah, blah, and develop that, that clandestine uh, presence. Okay, coming up, we're going to talk about some tools and some strategies that if you are being stalked, you don't want to miss this. Hey, welcome back to Kim Commando Explains. We're talking to our good friend, Rico Danielson, about cyber stalking. Ugh. Now, if you are being cyber stalked, Rico, what's the first thing that somebody should do? I mean, if they really believe like, oh my gosh, I, I, I feel it. It's in my gut. I see it's happening online. It's making me uncomfortable. I'm actually kind of scared. Yeah. What do we tell that person? Yeah. Step one, um, look in your inner circles. Who's the last person you actually had um, a fight with? Number two would be, why would they have a fight with you? And does anybody have any malicious intention behind that? And start capturing those conversations, whether it's screenshots, whether it's preservation or something. Because I guarantee you, it's no less than two degrees away from you. And that, um, that, that's where your cyber stalker resides at. Do you engage with them at all? I wouldn't, um, just because whenever you engage into a cyber uh, or a cyber stalker, one, they're already on edge, and two, they're going to get amped up very quickly, and the point of escalation is going to be zero to ten very very quickly. So I would kind of ease up on that. Um, just capture as much data as you can. Take it to law enforcement. I I'm not sure they're going to do too much, but you might have to engage a third party, such as uh, you know cyber professional or a private investigator or even possibly a body man, if you will. I'm sorry, a what man? Uh, body, bodyguard, body man, sorry. <laughs> oh, a body, okay, I'm like, I didn't know what that was. I'm like, oh, this is something I need to know, a <laughs> bodyguard. Because, you know, it's it's very frightening. Um, you know, fortunately, it hasn't happened to me, but I've taken so many calls from people who have been stalked. I mean, and, you know, we have that case where you actually helped, yeah. which was so nice of you, help uh, Dana and her daughter uh, try to figure out what was going on. Because 
you know, people are now going on these dating websites, and you never know who you're really talking to. True, right? very true. It's very hard to authenticate people. Um, that's why I'm big on just pick up the phone. Here's a here's a burner for cell phone, Google cell phone number. Hey, go ahead and give me a call. You know, let's talk for five minutes. Not everyone wants to talk nowadays, but that's the best way to understand who you're dealing with and if the person's authentic. Are there any other tools that if somebody's being stalked that we can tell them about? Uh, you know, if if you think you're being stalked, one of the things I would say is capture all the data elements. You know, if, if it's an email, look at the email. If it's a phone number. And then there's this really free where, free tool. It's called OSINT, um, OSINT Framework. You can punch in the phone number and also the email address right there. And usually the metadata comes back with some pretty granular stuff. And at that point, you can start doing your discovering your investigation. What's the web address for that? OSINTFramework.com. Well, Rico, thanks for explaining cyber stalking to everybody. Yeah, of course. Thanks for spending time with us. Anytime. Anytime. Hey, it's Kim Commando Explains. And just a quick reminder, we'd love you to rate and follow and review the podcast. And we've talked a lot about how big of an issue cyber stalking is. But now let's peel back the layers. So it all depends. That means you need to be aware and stay up to date on your accounts. And of course, we always recommend, I know, the mantra, strong, unique passwords. I know it gets tired for you to hear it as much as it's tiring for me to say it on all your accounts. Two-factor authentication, make sure you have a password that only you know. And make sure when you can use your fingerprint or any biometrics, use those too. It's all about adding these extra layers of protection to your digital life. Now, let's switch gears just a little bit. And let's talk about some tools and strategies you can use if somebody is harassing you online. And of course, thank you for listening. Now, before you totally go and hit the stop button, here are some more steps to follow. As Rico said, be sure that you file a police report. Cyber stalking is a crime. You can also go to cybersecurity experts for help. Now, in the past, I don't even remember this, a mom called my show asking for my help because the stalker followed her daughter's every move. Well, with Rico's help, we figured out who the guy was and now he's headed to jail, hopefully. Bottom line, if you need professionals, reach out. A special thank you goes out to Rico Danielson for his time, uh, Serena O'Sullivan for putting together the podcast, and Jeremy and JT and Danielle for just making us all sound so damn good. And just a quick reminder, I want you to rate, review, follow this podcast, because that's how we get more listeners. And thanks for listening.